long have you been a comedian? <laughs> 25 years. How long have you been a comedian, Bennett? Uh, ten, 10 years. And what, <laughs> um, I started... I started when I was 15. And uh, what's, your, what's your best joke? Uh, what's your inspiration? Who are your comedy icons? Is it more difficult for a woman to be a comedian? Um, do <laughs> we you wish you had funny. a penis? What do you think about that? Yeah, all that. Why don't you I'm just, just going to take that. Yeah. Ask yeah. What? Uh, completely out of context. So what's your favourite road <laughs> to drive on? <laughs> oh, what's your favourite motorway? What's your favourite motorway? Favorite, <laughs> favorite station on the M1? Oh, we should do that. Service station. My favourite service station is on the M5. It's Frankly Services because it sounds like it's really grumpy. Frankly Services. <laughs> uh, I don't know the M5 ones. I know the M4. Is Kev literally just talking to himself? I mean, I do I think have things so. to do. Uh, Are we connected to audio? audio? It's saying it's connected to audio. Ah, I've never seen that button before. Um, and yet I've cut out wow. so many times before now. Right, uh, we are recording and I cut out just after the theme tune, didn't I? Yeah. I don't know, it was so long ago. <laughs> well, it was a while. So I'll do the <laughs> beginning again. I have two guests with me today who've brought them. Oh, I'll do it with more enthusiasm. I have two guests with me today who've brought with them a panel from a comic or something close. We're going to see if we can identify it and talk about it. Maybe we and you will learn something about comics we didn't already know, or maybe we'll just show off a bit and have an enjoyable chat. Let's see. Joining me from the far-flung wilds of, I have no idea where you are. Bennett, where are you, Bennett? Um, I'm just outside London in my living room. Just I'm not giving you any more information than that because sounds I, like you Susan's a stalker. I know where he lives. <laughs> sounds like you're in some sort of ge geostationary satellite, like Halo Jones. Let, let's go with that. <laughs> yeah. what, uh, Susan, where are you? You're in well, Birmingham, nice. aren't you? Yeah. I'm not in Birmingham. How dare you? I'm in the black country at my oh. parents' house. Oh, which part of the black, black country? What constitutes the black country? Oh, well, it's a, it's a, I mean, you could do a whole podcast on this. Um, small town so like Wolverhampton, Willinall, Walsall, Bilston, um, Cradley, there's loads of like little towns that constitute the black country. Birmingham is not the black country. I never thought Birmingham was the black country, I thought you lived in Birmingham. Um, I actually live in London, but oh, I'm that... just here visiting. I've been, I've been in London for 30, I've been in London since the 80s mate, <laughs> but people still think I live up here and as it might be something to do with my accent, I haven't picked up the cockney one. I don't know why that might be. This is it for everybody, though, isn't it? Your accent, which you pretty well pick up in your teens, that characterises everybody, because, like, nobody believes I'm Scottish because I sound like this. Uh, Bennett, you, you're a very posh Welsh, aren't you? I'm, I'm posh Welsh. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's funny because when I go home, people say to me, well, where's that accent come from? But when I'm not at home, people go, oh, you've got such a strong accent. So I, I don't know. I know it gets stronger uh, when I speak to anybody. Well, in fact, I rang, I think it was EE -E -E to yesterday, and it, it transpired that the, uh, the woman I speak to was from Swansea. So within five minutes, I was going, well, no, right, there's a problem with it. And what, what it is, it's just not connecting. And I thought, what am I doing? Does your accent go up an, an octave as well to sound more Swansea? Uh, uh, it, go, it, it goes up an octave um, and uh, I sound drunk for some reason, probably because that's how I was raised. Um, but yeah, it, it, it varies and it, it does serve for some odd reason. I think Birmingham's got that as well, hasn't it? Birmingham has, has one of those uh, higher pitched. It's, it's got gangsters who sound like they're ever so slightly falsetto at times. Birmingham, yes, there's a very vocal speaking like this. Um, it's 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 quite it's similar to Welsh in the fact that it's quite sort of got that sing song lyrical. People mistake me for um, in fact, all the actors on Peaky Blinders mistake the black country accent for Liverpool. Mm. Yes, don't very... they? You get that with the Southwest and Norfolk as well. People conflate the two. Mummerset, they call it. Uh, now, you've both got really odd things on your CVs or descriptions. I'm going to begin with Bennett, fraud speaker. Now, you, you scroll down, you see writer, you see comedian. That makes sense. Fraud speaker, it sounds like you're, I don't know, a tribute act to yourself. What's a fraud speaker <laughs> mean? 
what is a fraud? <laughs> it means somebody who thinks they're good, but really isn't. <laughs> Uh, no, I, oh God. Um, I, so years and years ago, I did 20 something years ago, uh, I had my identity stolen and I became the first major victim of identity theft in the UK and sort of lost everything, became penniless and homeless, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then years later, I did a documentary about it uh, in which I stole the identity of the Home Secretary um, and got arrested by Scott in the Yard. Uh, so I now go around the world talking about fraud and identity theft and um, online cyber security and that type of stuff. Thank God, because stand-up doesn't pay well enough. So um, <laughs> I do this as well. So being a victim of crime, uh, you would recommend over a career in comedy? <laughs> uh, if I had to choose between the two, yes. <laughs> It, it, it couldn't have happened to a, a more appropriate person because this sort of thing obviously happens to people who then can't string a sentence together explaining it to other folk. Um, yeah, I mean, it's so weird that when it happened, it, it, it wasn't particularly amusing. And I never thought that 20 years later, I'd be going around the world doing uh, shows about it. But it's something, it's actually, it's something I really, really enjoy doing. Um, and I also go to companies and uh, do in-house corporate training videos for them. And uh, yeah, it's fun. It's something I've learned a lot about. So it's something I'm called in uh, on TV and radio if they're doing something about fraud. So to come in and do something, which is a nice sideline. Can I double check? You're definitely recording yourself at your end because we've got the worst time lapse. Am I meant to be recording myself as well? Because uh, I'm but, not. Do you know I can? Um... You don't. You don't have to, Susan. I mean, I'll, if you're able to, uh, I can then... do. But I didn't know. If you can record yourself and you both send me those files, then we get a clean feed of you. Uh, Bennett, you, you're breaking up at my end, so definitely the Zoom recording I'll have of you will be broken up. But if you've been recording yourself, that's fine. I can edit it back in. I can also take out the big delay because I know that when I finish speaking, I have to wait about five seconds for you to hear me. Ah, OK. Um, I can try and do something with my internet connection. I could put an Ethernet cable in. I don't know if that's going to help. But you'd have to wait. Should we do that? Because I think it would make think it smoother. I would if I were you. Right, pausing That's recording. Yeah, it's really bad. Sorry, you threw me. <laughs> right, recording is back in progress. I, I have no idea where we got up to. Let's just start from the very beginning. A very fine place to start. And, and then if we if we edit any other stuff in, brilliant. Um, dear listener at home, every now and again, uh, we have technical problems and we have a chat offline. And I, I can guarantee the chat offline is probably more interesting than uh, everything we're going to talk about. And it will never hour. be broadcast. Never be broadcast. <laughs> well, well, Susan, uh, can I talk about what we were just talking about? I no, can't, no, I can't. You, can't, no you, <sighs> you really can't. You okay, can't. everybody, give me the most boring half hour you've listened to because <laughs> uh, Susan, I, okay, Susan, I'll tell you one of the things we can talk about. Uh, which is you being a plane crash enthusiast. Uh, what? Oh, yeah. Who doesn't love a good plane crash? Come on. Like everybody. Have you got a favourite? We've all got one. Come on. Everyone's got a favourite plane crash. Uh, no, it's, that's way too grisly because it's largely got dead people in it. <laughs> no. 95% of plane crashes aren't fatal. Uh, yes, but the 5% that the rest of us know about are the big ones with all the dead people in. That's the problem, isn't it? It's because we know how the media works, because the media likes something that's completely catastrophic and shocking. So you're saying plane crashes get bad PR. <laughs> yeah, they do, don't they? Oh, it's a shame for them. <laughs> so you were doing some flying very recently. Uh, I, was I was following you on Facebook and you were up in a plane. What was this about? Well, I was I was meant to be doing a flying lesson because um, I'm friends with an air crash investigator. Of course I am. And um, <laughs> my birthday, he said, do you want he says, have you ever had a flying lesson? I went, no, and I don't want to actually, because I'm very scared of flying. And um, and then I mentioned it on Facebook and all my friends, all my evil comedy friends went, I paid to see you do that. And I thought, well, I suppose I could do it for the Comedians Benevolent Fund. So I went down to Shoreham, um, and because that's where he does his flying lessons from, this air crash investigator, because he's all, he was also a pilot. They always are. Um, and the weather's just been too bad. So I waited around, you know, I was down there for four days anyway, but the weather was just raining, 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 raining. So I've had to postpone it. I'm slightly glad, actually. It gave me a bad back with the stress of it. I was like, oh, it's going to 
to an osteopath while I was down there. I could feel my, my shoulder going twinge, twinge, twinge. Was this the stress of thinking about flying? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm really, really, I'm really scared of flying. I, I, I just... If I can That's because you look at all these bloody plane crashes. Well, exactly. I know I've done it to myself because I'm an idiot. I've watched way too much air crash investigation than is healthy. But the thing is, pilots and crew, they all watch air crash investigation and then they go to work. I mean, that's not like, that's like, you know, watching the, you know, the, the live at the Apollo where it's all gone horribly wrong and everyone died. But, yeah, you know, those, those, are, died those are the ones they don't broadcast. Yeah, or they edit, They can edit it. You can't edit a plane. You can't edit a flight, can you? <laughs> you can when subsequently you make it into a film with Tom Hanks and uh, everything changes. Uh, totally ha yeah, different true. happy ending. I, I'm gonna, having a look at everyone's CVs, just seeing who's got quite the more conservative details. Uh, so what's more conservative? Having written for Freddie Starr and Halen Pace or doing decompression gigs for, for the army? Uh, first of all, Halen Pace and Freddie Starr. That was neither today nor yesterday, was it, Bennett? Oh, yeah, very recent. Uh, yeah, my first ever um, writing job was for Halen Pace. Writing for Hill and Pace was the reason I got into stand up because I was writing sketches. And one day, a producer came back and said, We love all these apart from this particular one. And I said, Oh, no, that, that one's the funniest. And he went, Well, it's not. And I thought, I'm not going to argue with him because he's paying me. But I thought it was funny. And the only reason where I could find out if it was funny was to try and put it into some kind of stand up thing. So I never really wanted Can you remember what, what was it? Can you remember? Oh, what the, the joke? Yeah. In the, yeah, well, it's you'll know it because you see me performing 25 million times and it's still on my set. It, it was, how do I phrase it? It was a thing of, um, um, uh, I, was, uh, I was with a girl and she was talking, uh, we were talking about fantasies and she told me that she wanted to cover herself in whipped cream and for me to lick it off. And I said, I'd love to, but unfortunately I'm allergic to cream. And she said, don't worry, I'll use a substitute, which she did. Brian, his name was. So that was the... <laughs> That's a great gag. But I thought it was a really good gag, and they went, "No, no, that that won't work." And I went, "Well, no, it oh, okay." And then I tried it, and it got such a big response. I went, "Oh, that's a nice feeling." And I thought I'll try some more gigs. And my fourth ever gig was was at the comedy store, uh, believe it or not, when you could do that. And my fifth ever gig was the Late Show at Jongler's Battersea. So, oh my word, yeah. what was that like? Uh, it was fine because I didn't realise how nervous you were meant to be. Uh, and I remember I used to start off with a newspaper doing a crossword. Can you imagine? I mean, the thought I of doing that, that. I remember that. Do you remember that? The thought of doing that now at any show, let alone the late show at Battersea, quarter to one in the morning when everybody's drunk, going, I'll just soft start off with this soft, gentle crossword gag. <laughs> um, but they went with it because I had the, the I guess, the confidence of being new. I don't know. Ignorance and the confidence. Uh, absolutely. So it was that. And so that's the reason I got to stand up was because of writing for Hayden Pace, was Um yes, yeah, Hayden Pace were in they were the young do you remember Hayden Pace in the young one? Yes. Yeah, they were great. I yeah. quoted yeah. I quoted one of their gags just the other day. I do do wrong wrong. I do do wrong. Yeah. Which is a, a cracking line. Yeah, yeah. They, they were a real crossover be between the trad and the the uh, what did we call it? Alternative in those days. Yeah, mm. and they're lovely guys. I mean, really nice, funny guys. And yeah, it was, uh, it was a great job. Very nice writing job. Susan, what's a decompression gig? A decompression gig is when uh, the troops have been at war or an occupied territory and they, uh, they get brought back to a base in Europe somewhere to decompress so that they don't immediately come home and start beating their girlfriends up. So it's they, the army have to look after them. So they give them a show and it gives them music and they take them out for the day, like kayaking and stuff like that. They give them like a little two, two day little break and then send them back to England. And so when they come to the decompression gigs, they're all a bit mad because they've all have been shot at for four months. Yeah. Um, so um, they were difficult. And I was the first woman to ever MC a gig for the forces after Vera Lynn. <laughs> oh. Hard act to follow, Vera. <laughs> well, they weren't making me sing. I did some jokes. Um, yeah, they were. They were tough gigs, actually. 
but you kind of learned how to do them and like you got better as you as you went along so yeah well, let's see if this podcast gets better as it goes along, as we have a look at the two panels that uh, my guests have brought with them. They brought a panel from a comic, and I've read that bit before. I've asked everyone on the panel to bring a panel to the panel. You can see these images on my website, kevfcomicartist.com, and they should be on the holding artwork for this episode of the podcast, depending where you get your podcasts from. But don't worry, listener at home, you shouldn't need to see these pictures, because we're going to do an amazing job of describing them. Let's Let's have a look first at the picture that Bennett has brought in. Can we both see that? Yeah, I'm sort of regretting it now because I didn't realize it was going to be explained. In a well, there's a lot of words to read. Well, let's see, Susan, what you can describe here. Okay, well, there's a bit of light shining on it. You obviously took that by the window. Um, so it's People looking at a, oh, it's a map. It's a graphic of an electric map. And it's a person who's got purple skin saying, the quaint little people just west of England, Iceman. Picture the Scots without the sex appeal. <laughs> or the Irish without the laughing. You've pretty much got them nailed. And then there's a person in a detective type looking hat that says, very bloody amusing. I don't think Agent Braddock. Yeah. Now, for the benefit of the panelologists at home who study line and colour and composition, I would say, Bennett, that you've cropped in really close on a bigger picture. Am I right? Uh, I have, because the rest of it was a massive giveaway. Uh, so. Right. OK. We, so we've cropped in so close that we're actually seeing up the nostril of a character who's got an earring. I, I wonder if the earring's a telltale part of the costume. I can't tell. She's female. It looks like a, her face is white and lit with purple light and green lit on the side. Uh, the bloke in the hat... We can just about tell he's a bloke, but we can mostly just see his hat. And then, I don't know what giveaways you were trying to avoid, but at the bottom, there's the top of someone's beret, which has got a circle with an X in it, almost like they have in X-Men comics. And then in the voice Damn bubble, it. which you've left in there, someone refers to X-Men, you know, like in the X-Men comics, and also refers to Agent Braddock, Braddock being the surname of at least two people in the X-Men comics. So <laughs> I'm going to stick my neck out... <laughs> and suggest this is from an X-Man comic. Susan, would you like to have a guess? Uh, yeah, I reckon, I, I'll go with what you say. I reckon it's probably from an X-Man comic. <laughs> Bennett, tell us what we're looking at. <laughs> well, yeah, I, mean, I didn't want to make it too difficult. The, the thing is, I mean, I've got, uh, I, actually, I don't even know if you know how big my comic book collection is, Ken, no? or, or um, how much I'm into comics, or the fact my mother, bless her, who, who passed away a couple of months ago, um, threw away um, my comic book collection, which I've worked out it would have been worth around £75,000. Um, oh, my God. How long ago was, uh, was that disposed of? Uh, 30 years ago. Um, this is it not, not an uncommon thing. My no, early comics. But uh, when I tell face. you that um, the comic books I had were some from the 60s, were number two Fantastic Four and things of that ilk. Oh, um, man. So, uh, yes. Uh, so, yes, I've, I've been a massive comic book fan since the age of whatever, six or something. What did you say to your mom? How did that conversation go? Well, they were moving home when I said, please, whatever you do, don't throw away this comic book collection. Went, no, no, no. I went, no, no, really, don't throw it away. And she went, no. And it was so dismissive. I went, that's going to be thrown away. Oh. So the minute they moved, I went to the house and I said, where's the comic book collection? And she went, I don't know. I did. Um, it had been thrown away. So it was just, but my kids are never, ever, ever let her forget it. Uh, and I go to a lot of comic book conventions and I just cry. Really. <laughs> um, <laughs> So <laughs> you 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 started seriously, and of course, back in those days. So you're collecting in the '80s, right? You could yeah. still pick up uh, a lot of comics from the '60s yep. for pocket money prices, throwaway prices, and in good conditions. Prices. And I have got a couple of things now that I'm very proud. Of. I've got um, signed poster, I mean, proper framed um, Stanley posters, which I'm I'm uh, very very proud of. Especially that I found out two days ago that one of them I bought for five hundred pounds is now worth three thousand pounds. So. Um, which, you know, doesn't make up for anything, but at least it's gone up in price, which is... Well, no, because I find for real comic collectors, well, what I'd call real comic collectors, them being worth the money, that's not the true value, is it? No, no, absolutely. Um, although my comic book collection was worth a lot. So I said I could have gone through, my mother threw it away, I don't know if I mentioned that. Um, I uh, So I could have chosen a lot of the... And I chose it, and the reason I chose this is because, uh, as Susan so beautifully and eloquently read, uh, the, the lines refer to a quaint little people just west of England, picture the Scots without the sex appeal or the Irish without the laughs, and he is, of course, or she's, of course, talking about the Welsh. 
Um, and this, <laughs> so when I read that, I went, what? That's just rude. Um, and then, and this is the other reason I mentioned it, because this is just showing off, I wrote to Mark Miller, who, who wrote it um, on Twitter privately, and I went, you wrote this, and he wrote back laughing, saying, yep, it hasn't changed. So, <laughs> can you uh, tell us what, what comic exactly we're looking at here? Uh, yes, it's, um, it's uh, oh gosh, 18 years ago, the uh, Ultimate, uh, Ultimate X-Men is the... Um, and that's by uh, Mark Miller. And is that drawn by Brian Hitch? Yes, it is. Excellent. Yes, the X the ultimate titles are largely what the modern movies are based on, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, which uh, I really like. Uh, well, I've liked all the X-Men films, uh, apart from uh, the original X-Men 3. I don't think that worked. And the last two X-Men films um uh haven't worked in in my opinion but i love the first two i mean how many, how many they've them. made you don't seem to like a lot of them uh well they did sort of three of the original ones um and then they did another four they did x-men first class and sort of used those um although they did the second one sort of jumped back and forth i'm rubbish with names but they jumped back and forth between but are you are you a fan of the x-men comics primarily and the films are also there or do you take the x-men films now so seriously that they compete with the comics um, i was never a massive comic book fan of x-men i was very big fan of avengers huge fan of fantastic Four, spider-man daredevil was my favorite which is the other panel i was going to go with was daredevil fun enough but which I, period of daredevil uh frank miller Right, probably is. Um, I, mean, I loved uh, all that. The, the Born Again saga was probably, you know, one of my favorites. And when Daredevil came on TV and the series with uh, Charlie Cox on Netflix, my daughter said to me, she has never seen me smile all the way through every episode of a program. Uh, I've now watched it, I think, five times. My son has watched it seven times. Uh, my daughter said, it's probably the best program to be on television in the history of television. And what is it about it? Is it the fact that someone's taking your childhood comics seriously? Yeah, it's exactly the same as when I saw the first Avengers film. Uh, I just went, all the, all the memories came back, all the childhood memories. I went, I loved all these characters and they're now together and it's done perfectly. So, yeah, very excited. Have you seen many of the superhero movies, Susan? No. Well, that, was a, that, was a, that was a short conversation. <laughs> and the podcast really, ended dramatically. Really, really not my thing. I don't like sci-fi. <laughs> I don't like Maybe not my thing. I, I, I like true life murder stuff, true life crime. That's what I'm into. And, and playing and true life, you know, plane crash documentary. That's what I like. <laughs> it is interesting who picks up on uh, science fiction and comics. And the fact that that comic books do fantasy predominantly. I mean, even in countries like France, where they do, let's face it, some of the most boring comics in the world, they'll do comics about ballet and history, but there's still a hell of a lot of fantasy. Not as much as in America, not as much as in Japan, but it's still always there. I can't, what is it about it that gets us? Uh, to me, it's just the suspension of disbelief. It's, I might still read comic books uh, in bed. I, I read graphic novels because they help me fall asleep because you just sort of get taken away from, you know, reality, I suppose. And and I, I am able to, if I go to the theatre, I cannot uh, suspend disbelief at all. It's just something I, I'm completely incapable of doing. I know I'm in the theatre. I know there are actors on stage. I'm looking around. I'm aware of the people next to me. Reading comic books uh, to me is very, very easy to be taken away. Seeing that, I did, of course, see Susan's wonderful Edinburgh show about plane crashes, which if she ever does again, I recommend everybody go to see because it was one of my favourite things I've seen. Yeah, not let's, let's, let's not bad, bad mouth people standing on stages, given that it's what we do for a living. Now, I'm talking about I'm talking about plays right. more than more than stand up. I'm talking about, I don't know what it, I mean, I went to drama school, I trained as an actor. I remember we had to come back after seeing the first production we saw and write a thesis on it. And I just went, I didn't believe any of it. So I have, de I'm, musicals are even worse. I just- Oh, I can't bear musicals, I hate I, musicals. Yeah, I was I made to go and see Hamilton and I was fuming yeah. because it was bad enough. And then somebody started rapping in French. I was just <laughs> livid, yeah. I was absolutely furious. 
I, I don't I don't get me. I mean, it, say it or don't say it, but why sing it? It, it makes no sense. You, you get a lot of people have the same snobbishness about comic books. I've heard people on the radio on a, a good read being proud of their inability to read comics, saying things like, I didn't know whether you were supposed to go from the left to the right. And what were the words in bubbles? It, art forms just suit some people, don't they? So were you really young when you started reading comics, Bennett? Oh, yeah, yeah very young. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, four or five, I guess. And what would you have started with at four and five? Um, fantastic book. Right, from the British reprints or from colour yeah. comics? Uh, from the, um, well, a friend of mine had, I think it was his dad's original sort of comics. So I read them from the beginning, the original. I mean, I held the first ever editions of um, Spider-Man, uh, Fantastic Four, uh, Daredevil. So, you know, I these were first, uh, free, oh, but these, these were British reprints, but they were still, you know. Yeah, they, they were originals, but worthless. Uh, originals, but oh, not, not now, though. Now, worth a lot. Well, um, but Mighty World of Marvel from 1973. I put all mine on eBay a few years ago, and uh, either I was screwed over or everybody else thought they were. No, I don't mean those. I mean that the, the American, the British version of the American comics. Oh, with 10, I mean. with 10p on instead of with, 10 cents. That's right. With, right. with 6d, I think, it was on the, uh, on the front cover or something similar. Whatever yeah. that was. I have a few of those knocking about. Why? I have one in the studio beside me here. Uh, it's uh, War of the Worlds with Kill Raven there. Uh, oh. that, that cost me two pounds. That was just uh, last year. So uh, I've got, clearly not got the most valuable Don McGregor and Gene Coburn comic here in my hands. Uh, that, sorry, that was for the benefit of the camera. That's getting edited out. So <laughs> look, looking at the picture here on the screen, they're having a go at the Welsh. Has there ever been a Welsh superhero? No. Oh, you've obviously researched that, Bennett. <laughs> yeah, I'm just really angry about it. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I, 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 as far as I hang can... on, hang on, Tom Jones. Now he is a superhero. Come on, yes, he, he is a superhero. Hasn't had his own. I mean, he probably has had his own comic strip. He appears uh, in Mars Attack. So I, if there's a I comic imagine, adaptation of Mars Attack, he's in it. No, I imagine okay. he's stripped quite a lot. <laughs> You'd hope. I, I'm sure you imagine that <laughs> often. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, you know, Captain Britain probably visited Cardiff, but um, I don't think there's been a, as far as I know, that there hasn't been. Die Hard was the closest. <laughs> <It's definitely laughs> <different. laughs> Okie dokie. Well, we've done the Welsh. Now we're going to have a look at uh, what comes from the black country and your tastes in comics. Sh Susan, I'm about to share your selection. Brace yourself, Bennett. Because you've got to describe what you're looking at here. It's all yours. Oh, for goodness. And nothing screams Susan more than this. So um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, a, it's one panel uh, called Rude Kid. Um, and the mother, I think that's a mother, is saying to the son, have you tidied your bedroom yet, young man? And the little boy who looks very, very angry says, a piss up a rope fuck stick. <laughs> um, so I'm guessing this is very early dandy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fantastic phrase. Somebody used this phrase on Facebook just last week in a conversation about something else. It was just, it led to this phrase. So it's lodged in people's minds. Uh, for the benefit of uh, listeners at home, you can see this picture. A censored version appears on the artwork for this episode, but not the full version. You'll find it on my website, kevfcomicartist.com. And if from that description, you haven't guessed where it's from, um, you clearly have never seen this magazine before. But Bennett, you, do you know actually have a guess where it's from? Um, I'm assuming it's Viz. It's Viz, isn't it? Rude Kid in Viz. And this is quite early on, I think. I mean, Rude Kid appears right early on. He appears right back in 1979, I think, in 1980. He might be in the very first Viz. And he was in really inventive swears. Um, uh, Susan, uh, tell us more. Utter, utter genius. I think this was early 90s. The one. I mean, I don't know whether they recycled them because I didn't realise he'd been in the, in the magazine they, that long. They definitely don't recycle them because they collect up the best and put them in a book and people visit and revisit Viz. And they really, I mean, you once you've read something in, in Roger's Profanosaurus, that's mm. gospel, that's history, that's yeah, setting I mean, stone. They've, they've 
I mean, I, I do love swearing. Um, and you know, Roger's Profanosaurus, it just it's just kind of changed the lexicon of swearing, hasn't it, really? And I remember seeing this in Viz magazine and I just I it still makes me laugh now. And this is like over 30 years ago. I just and it's always stuck with me, like piss up a, piss up a rope, fuck stick. It's like, <laughs> and, like, the, and then I would sit and I would imagine somebody actually trying to piss up a rope. And I actually <laughs> tried to like visualize that. And fuck stick is just hilarious, isn't it? <laughs> and oh god, I love Viz magazine. We used to like buy it, and then we'd sit around reading it out, like you know, like in the olden days, they'd sit around the 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 radiogram and listen to programs. We'd sit and we'd read out Viz magazines and read out the letters and stuff like that. And uh, there were so many brilliant, brilliant things in it. And I remember they um, do you remember when they started bringing out animations of of yeah. this stuff and they did the fat slags? Yeah, and it was Jenny Eclair and Kathy Burke who played the fat slags, yeah. and then John Thompson. They were they were working at um um a holiday camp, and John Thompson was the comic turn that turns up, and um I, I just remember I bootlegged it loads of times to give to my friends. I remember it was it was it was, a specific, it was like a Christmas present for lots of people, and um the the stand up that they wrote for the comic turn because it was based on Roy Chubby Brown, right? Right. And um, and I remember in the animation he was going um, may I, I don't know if I can I can swear this much. He goes, "May waves cunt big as a car park, park me car, and if you're the night I couldn't find it in the morning. May waves cunt is a multi-story car park." And then and then he's chatting up the fat slags and they're asking for his autograph and he's going, "I haven't got a pen. I'll have to use me cock. I'll have to write it in spunk, man." And I just remember thinking it was the before I started stand-up, it was one of the funniest things I'd ever, ever, ever heard because it was so wrong and so rude. And I abs- I just fell in love with it. I just loved it. And I worked in animation at that time as well. So it was like a double whammy of like hysterical stuff. There's nothing like this. Uh, it was uh, revolutionary because it, they did something that at the time people would say, you can't do anything like this and nobody will ever buy it. So, of course, they did and people did. It's also, I think, going to be taken more seriously than almost anything done in comics of that time or most times. Do you remember? I remember a documentary. It must have been the 90s when Viz was selling a million copies. And Oberon War, Evelyn War's son, was on there comparing Viz to Rabelais. And saying that there was there was none was better than the other. There's a, a, a cartoon advert that Viz had done where you wiped your ass by uh, cycling on a bike and then the bike would go up your ass crack and wipe it for you. And <laughs> Oberon War compared that to the example from Ra- Rabelais where the, the giant Gargantua wipes his ass on a downy swan. I think it's downy swan or downy goose. And uh, yeah, it is the same thing. One's made up by a 14th century monk and mm. one's made up by some guys in uh, Newcastle but they're quite right you know remember they did a talk called swearing is both big and clever Alex, <laughs> no, Alex Collar and Simon that. Donald they took that to uh, Edinburgh so we know Alex we know Alex and Simon don't we because you know Alex writes I, I know him from writing for Radio 4 and Simon because he does character stand-up on, in the clubs yeah. um, and they're both really really great guys you know, I tell you, do you remember the adverts they used to have there was a brilliant 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 one and it was a, it was a, it was like it was taking the Mickey out of you know the like the Daily Mail Sunday supplement adverts that you would get, and they would just sell utter nonsense, right? And there was um, there was a, a China Hitler doll as a little boy, right? <laughs> but the words, it was like a, a look at it, look into his icy malevolent blue eyes and all this kind of stuff. And there was another one, and it was a little girl, um, and she was stood, and like it was a little doll, but she was but. <laughs> next to a bottle of bleach and it was mummy this lemonade tastes funny (laughs) (laughs) they were so sick oh god they used to have me i just i really like dark sick humor it really really gets me you know like it tweaks my funny bam and uh, i just love viz i just i thought it was like when you first read viz when you're kind of like a teenager because it was very much a sort of student mag wasn't it and it was just mind-blowing it was kind of like the sort of like because i remember like the young ones was the, the mind-blowing TV program. This was the mind-blowing, you know, um, magazine that I was reading because they were just, uh, but I've got to just say, I used to think the graphic novel meant pornographic. <laughs> I didn't realise it just meant drawn. <laughs> Such a wrong phrase. Um, but yeah, well, I just, uh, and we, we all loved this, didn't we? What I loved about Viz was the fact that there were normal people. That is to say, everybody else who got 
to make humour or got to be journalist seemed to be posh. I mean, I now discover they totally, they all weren't, but like the young ones, for example, were posh. Ben Elton and Richard Cur Curtis, posh. They, they came from public school backgrounds or they came from Oxbridge. And Viz were very much the exceptions to that rule, especially in written comedy. Yeah, yeah, they were fantastic. They were fantastic. And, you know, the, I mean, I know Gary, I, I, mean, I, I sent off some stuff to, uh, to Letterbox. And I think Gary Delaney, I think he had, he might have had some stuff printed in there. But of course, now we know people who actually write it. And they had some brilliant, like, brown bottle and Sid the Sexy, the Fat Slags and Nobby's Piles and Mrs. Brady, old lady. It was just, fat, it just, you know, just genius. Proper, Billy, proper the, comic Billy the genius. Fish, I think, is one of my favourites. Billy the Fish, yeah. Which, yeah. Which, they, they coined some um, really iconic groundbreaking thoughts in Billy the Fish's stadium, the adverts that go around the edge that say, eat food, drink <laughs> liquids, shit in your toilet. <laughs> things that you think they're amazing and no one thought of those before. I mean, I know that's the thing with all humour, but sometimes these things are like a, a paradigm shift in, in <laughs> comedy writing. And I think Viz totally is that. I, yeah, didn't think, yeah. I didn't think a lot of the, you know, when they, they did the sort of cartoon version of it, I, I the animated thing for uh, Channel 4, I didn't think a lot of it worked because it was so much better when you could hear it in your head than actually hearing people doing the voices, in my opinion. It's, it's often the way when you translate something from one art form to another because you've got to be right on top of it. It's like when they do stand-up in a movie or in a TV show and you look at it and think, well, that would die on its ass because that's been yeah. written by someone. It's not right. It doesn't yeah. ring true. And same with these guys. They wrote it. They drew it. They got it right. They knew what they were doing. And if you change that in any way, you change the space, you change the time, even though they had like they had Peter Cook doing voices and Jimmy yeah. Nail doing voices. That's not enough to necessarily make it work. Yeah. Um, you know that the little boy in the in the uh, drawing, the rude kid, doesn't he look like the comedian Steve Harris? No, <laughs> and he probably was like that as a kid as well. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, just He's got more hair than Steve now, bless him. You are. Again, <laughs> looking at looking at that hair. drawing as well, it's it's really unpretentious. She's she, the mother, has got no ears, and the face is almost like a Picasso drawing of a face. I mean, the eyeball has gone right inside the nose. If yeah. that was done as a fine art picture up on a wall, you'd say that somebody was doing a Picasso. I think Chris Donald, who I think drew this, uh, it might be Chris Donald, it might have been Simon Donald, but I think that we were just doing as well as they could, and it came out a bit shit. It's very Punch and Judy esque, isn't it? Yeah, it's very, very, it's like something I would draw. I, I, I couldn't even draw that. I'm so, so terrible at art. I'm really hopeless. <laughs> uh, some of us who make a living from drawing would feel the same. Uh, thank you, guys. <laughs> You've brought in some stonkers today. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Bennett. We've just been looking at uh, The Ultimate X-Men by Mark Miller and Brian Hitch having a go at the Welsh. And we've been having a look at Rude Kid from Viz Comic saying piss up a rope fuck stick. Uh, if you've got any questions that you'd like to ask us about these pieces or anything in general, you can find us on our various social media. Bennett, where do we find you? Um, usually hiding behind bins. But online, it's uh, bennettaron.com. And Susan, where would we find you on the socials? Um, I'm that Susan Murray on Twitter. I'm Susan Murray Comedian on Instagram and Facebook. And my website is susan-murray.co.uk. But I'm mostly, mostly twatting around on Facebook. That's where I seem to live my life. And you'll find me at KevF Comic Artist on Twitter and the website kevfcomicartist.com. Uh, that was Comic Cuts. Please click subscribe to be sure of hearing every episode when it comes out and leave us a review. Why don't you? It does help. Thanks again to Bennett. Thanks to Susan. And thanks to you at home for listening. I've been KevF. This has been Comic Cuts, the panel show. And we're out. <laughs> uh, that was fun. My first ever comic that I read. Oh, I've just broken the furniture in my parents room um was twinkle twinkle has featured in this uh, it featured in the very has first really? episode we recorded oh. yeah uh, nurse uh, nurse betty was it nurse i can't remember something. any of the stuff that's i can't remember anything that's in there it was twinkle and then it was mandy and these are all dc thompson comics because we used to get like the bruins and like the scottish family all that business and i didn't i've just looked them up and i didn't realize they were dc thompson as, as well um 
Yeah, most 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 of, most of the best girls ones were uh, Mandy Bunty, uh, Twinkle Princess Tina, Jackie. Of course, they were all DC. I, we all read Jackie. My brother used to deliver uh, papers, and on the comics always came out on Wednesday. So what he did, he'd bring them home and read them, and then deliver them the next day. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, oh, my brilliant. my first my first two thousand ads are all ink stained because they were in as I was Inside doing my paper. Newspaper. Well, no, I was doing my paper round and I slid it down the side of my paper round bag. So in between every newspaper I deliver, I'm walking along reading it, sticking it back in the bag, and just smearing it with yeah. uh, newspaper down both sides. Oh. Cheers, guys! You've been brilliant. That was absolutely fantastic. We're going to be doing that one in. I'll just stop the recording. Now.